Welcome. I'm a Pommy. This is a podcast. Welcome to the Pommy podcast. Today on my show, I have Mr. John Sermon. John, how you doing, mate? I'm very well, mate. Very well. Can you hear me over the jacket? Is it not too loud for you? It's very loud. I love it. <laughs> Cheers, by the way. Cheers. My, my glass is over there, but yeah, salut. So, so, salut, salut. Yeah. Um, mate, we've had a bit of a uh, roller coaster start to our relationship, shall I say? We met back in December 2022. We did, over a nice bottle of rose from memory. Over a nice bottle of rose. Since then, we've probably done what, maybe coming up to our fifth deal now. Together. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've been helping each other grow, flourish, and succeed down under. For the audience, let's go back to young John growing up back in the UK. <laughs> yeah, what can right. you tell me about your upbringing and where you come from? Oh, mate, so I'm, um, I've, I've been over here 13 years. I moved over to Australia in 2010. Um, that Young John, I'm the baby of four. Um, so I've got uh, two sisters, then an older, older brother. Uh, he's probably in his mid 50s going on 18 so that's probably where I get a lot of my humor and childish behavior um, but mate, I, was, I had a really good childhood I was very very happy um, pretty sporty didn't really excel at many sports um, always into my music always into I guess uh, meeting and greeting people the school report card said could have tried harder but good presentation I feel like that was very <laughs> similar to me I had a, uh, a very slightly above average yeah. time through for, through yeah. primary and secondary yeah. school but it, had, a, had a lot of mates but probably didn't excel yeah <laughs> it was always a b minus or a c plus yeah around that sort yeah. of yeah i mean who wants to be the a grade style yeah so how did you find school what was secondary school like for you did you enjoy school was it like a a noz for you did you just enjoy going to see your friends and your family and yes yeah, it's, it's a good question i don't there's nothing that really sticks out. University probably sticks out. And I guess that, that 14 to 16 probably stick out a little bit more for me. I, I did have a good time at school, uh, enjoyed the sports side of things. I, I went to a school in, in Wokingham in Berkshire. So we did a lot of after, after sports activities, a lot of extracurricular stuff, which I liked. You know, con- we had something called Combined Cadet Force, which was like, in essence, kind of Cub Scouts meets Army. So you'd go away on exercise. Um, We'd kind of go on ski trips, so lots and lots of that stuff, which I really, really enjoyed. Um, but sitting in a classroom, yeah, I kind of got through, but I, you know, I get distracted quite easily. You know, yeah. sometimes I'd be the class clown because I'd be like, right, can we just, can we do something? Um, but yeah, I, I got through. I don't get that from your personality, mate. <laughs> class clown and dad jokes. <laughs> I saw your Christmas in July outfit the other day. Oh, yeah, how good was that? Yeah, yeah, nice. Short sleeve suit. Get the pins and, out. Oh my. I got called semi-skimmed a few night, a few times <laughs> on that night because I'm not famous for sitting out in the sun, mate. I crisp up really well over here, but um, not famous for that. But they were milky white, milky white pins. So um, after secondary school, university, yeah, big part of your life. What did you study? How was the university experience for you? Do you feel that it was uh, a benefit to your life as it is now? Yeah, big time. <clears throat> I mean, for me. Uh, it was at the time as well where you kind of felt like you had to go to university. It was like the done thing. So uh, I remember I was, I was seeing a girl at the time. She was at Loughborough Uni and I'm from down uh, in Surrey, a little town called Camberley. So I kind of looked at basically universities that were in between the two. So I actually went to Coventry University. No one yeah. goes to Coventry. Um, it's, it's not an obviously aesthetically pleasing city. It's very grey. You've got the ring road, which is chaos. Um, but for me, I was like, right, Loughborough where I lived um, and I went in between and I did a marketing management degree because my theory was very simply all companies need marketing management. So yep. for my A-levels, I did G, um, what they call a GNVQ, which is like vocational stuff, but it was in business. And then I did PE. Um, and then I thought, well, if I can do marketing, then I might niche into sports or but every company needs marketing. So what I really enjoyed about that, I guess, was a lot of the the, the, the thoughts, the theories, the practices that you still use today, whilst the mediums are really, really different because a lot of the stuff is on digital, a lot of that, I guess, consumer behavior, uh, looking at demographics, socioeconomic groups, that kind of stuff, you can still relate to back then. Um, but yeah, I did a three-year degree. I came out with a two-one, so again, got what I needed to do. Um, and then kind of fell into my jobs after that, but was using my degree all the time, which was kind of ironic because I didn't really think I would do. So where did you fall into place after? So university? I um, 
so it's quite funny because I finished uni and then a mate of mine who was working for a currency brokerage firm called uh, Halewood International Foreign Exchange uh, changed name to High Effects. They're now XE, but they were in essence a currency broker. So they were recruiting. So he said, "Oh, mate, do you want to come along and just have a chat?" I said, "No." <laughs> I said, huh. "I've just finished uni. I want to take a year out. I'd signed up to do something called Camp Quality because one of my mates at uh, uni was at Camp Quality. What does so that involve? So Camp Quality is like your your in essence, they help um, families where their children, especially spouses, have perhaps got a terminal illness like yeah. cancer. Yeah. So you'd go away for a week and you'd just look after the children, okay. and, and I guess give give the sibling a break or look after one of the other one of the other children as Wait, well. Give the family a break. That's awesome. So it's actually an Aussie-based charity. Yeah. So I'd done a few of those at uni, signed up to do a few of those when I'd done, but I, I went for this interview to do a favour for my mate. And uh, most people, and don't try this at home, kids, but most people prepare for an interview, right? They look at what the business does, maybe what they can be doing, all of that. I did none of the above. I was literally a week outside of uni. Um, and I just spoke to the guy um, for, for an hour and you know, put, put the old man's suit on, you know, collar that was too big, shirt that was too big, but, you know, walked in like I meant it and spoke for about an hour. And he said, right, I've got to ask you, like, do you know what we do? And I said, no. I said, I haven't got a clue. I said, I'm a week out of university. I'm here because my mate James has you know, asked me to come along. And he said, look, I love your honesty. <laughs> he yeah. said, I can't teach you what we've just done because I've never met you before. But we've obviously just spoken and had a nice conversation. I can teach you what we do very quickly. But it's a people business. Yeah. So do you want the job? And I said, can I think about it? <laughs> so, and it was that time where I remember driving home and I rang my sister, who's an HR. My other sister was in recruitment at the time. And I was like, I've been offered the job. And they were delirious. They were beside themselves. And I was like, hmm. And it was that whole... if I'm going to take it or not. Yeah, but it was that whole <laughs> thing of like, just do it for a year. Just get a year of industry yeah, under your belt. Do you remember? Like, Put it on your get, CV. Yeah, all yeah. of that. So I took the job and it was in Windsor. So great, beautiful part of the world to work. Absolutely stunning. And I was there for seven years. Um, and in that time, so I was basically talking to clients all the time about transferring money to buy properties in France or Spain or Dubai, right? And so I would just talk. And so what I then started to do was if they were buying a property through a developer in Spain, oh, yeah. I'd ask them what the name of the developer was or what the name of the real estate agent was. So I'd get that name. I'd then you know, convert that client. I'd help them do their transfer. Mm. And I'd then call up the developer or the real estate agent and pitch them and say, hi, Mr. Developer, I've just had... Ross on the phone, he's just transferred his deposit for his euros, you know, to, to start building this property. Do you want to send me all of your clients that need to do a transfer? So I did that over the years and built a really large book of referral partners. Yes, yeah, massive network. Because they were just like, hey, I'm going to send John all my clients because yeah. not only do my clients get a better rate, I get the money quicker and all of that. You're doing them a favour. Exactly. So Everyone's a winner. That's kind of how I felt. So again, it kind of brought that marketing piece back into, into yeah. the corporate world. Um, and it was great. It was a really good... I mean, look, it was, it was a sales culture, but it, I think it kind of groomed me really well for that discipline, the cold calls, the relationship stuff. You know, uh, I remember one day it was like, we weren't allowed to sit down unless you'd done a sale. You know, so there's a little bit of that boiler room stuff, but it just, it kind of got you in the right way in that right mindset. And it was competition. Yeah. If you ask enough, someone's going to say yes, yeah. right? Um, and then, yeah, so I was there for seven years um, and then got off an opportunity to basically work for another broker here in Australia. Um, they had a London office, so I figured I was going to go and work for their London office. But I actually got asked to come to headquarters in Sydney. Kind of ironic because my parents were always like, hey, learn a language. So I learned German and French. End up moving to a country that's And ended up moving to Australia. <laughs> <laughs> so don't Chinese is very helpful over here. Chinese is very helpful. And, and yeah. so is Italian. I've got a lot yeah. of Italian. A lot mates. of Italian, um, yeah. So yes, yeah, so then that, I kind of cut my teeth in that referral partnership space and, and that partnership play. And I guess when I came over here, I had to start again and, and build that network again, which is kind of how you and I started, right? So when you're an expat, you don't really know a lot of people. You've got to go again. So you have to, you've got to trust a little bit quicker, but you've also got to, I guess, learn or, you know, that cliche of fail fast or learn quick. You know, you've got to do that a lot quicker now with people that you work with. So, yeah. And that all kind of comes back from just doing a marketing degree. Mate, that's mental. So how old were you when you eventually came over to Sydney? Um, so it was 2010. Oh, so just before 30. 
just before 30. Yeah, and when yeah, you landed, right. had you been to, you'd been to Australia before? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd been over here before. Um, and a, a mate of mine, and again, that I'd worked with in Windsor, um, had actually moved here as well in 2007. So he was very <laughs> kind, uh, a guy called Tom, and just basically said, look, here's my, here's my Rolodex of people. So look, and he gave me a great bit of advice. He said, in year one as an expat, just say yes to everything, you know, as yeah. long as it's moral, legal, and ethical, right? But like build your network. Just you just got to go out and find your friends. Meet see what as you many do, people meet as, as many possible. People. Talk to as many people as possible. So kind of very top of funnel, right? If you're thinking about it from a sales point of view. So, um, so that that was a great bit of advice for me to kind of build my life over here. Um, and again, when you're in sales, yeah, you know, there's a lot of networking events. So I'd go to the opening of an envelope, you know, because I didn't have to cook at home. <laughs> you're meeting new people. And you'd find out the good ones with good canapes and good good champagne, and you'd yeah, go to you'd those. Yeah, you go both of those. Exactly, hundred percent. You don't want to go. You don't want to go to the rubbish ones. Yeah, you've been to a few where there's you know, you're yeah. just like, oh, is the food was a bit off today. That, Why that, do we bother with yeah. that? That pie's just burnt my mouth a little. Yeah. Bit. <laughs> so yeah, so then that that enabled me just to, again build the network over here, and so I then was at a company called Oz Forex, which is now OFX. That was like the original Aussie fintech, again in money transfers, and I um I built out there distribution channel and referral network and, and their team uh, basically started in Sydney but then it, it, I built out the model across the world by kind of doing the same teams and again that was really kind of narrowing down you know who were our ideal clients what were they doing what was their why and and I guess what you learn is if you get a client from a referral partner or that's heard of you or through someone that's going to advocate for you you know that client's going to convert quicker um, because they've already got that trusted partner that's yeah. flown the flag. Hundred um, percent. But their 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 spend and their loyalty is going to be they're going to be stickier. Stickier, stickier yeah, client sure. as well. So, um, and so yeah. So I kind of built that out, and I guess built those verticals, those channels through professional services, through online, through kind of luxury and lifestyle. You know, I'm partial to going out and doing tough laps in the harbour on on a few super yachts. Um, again, good canapes. Um, <laughs> and that's just one of the best canvases in the world, isn't it? Sydney Harbour. Mate, it is. I mean, we got the Thames in the UK, but it's it's a bit grubby. Sydney Harbour is, yeah, <laughs> next level. I mean, there's one thing I love about Sydney is you've got the city life, you've got the beaches, you've got the water, yeah. you've got the mountains nearby. Yeah. You Where in the world do you get all of it? Like, exactly. It's it's pretty mega. Yeah. And it's when, people, it's when your mates go, so when are you going back? And you go, what? What? When are you coming over? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Come over. There's a free place to stay. Yeah. You know, just book the flight. Come Ex over. Exactly. I mean, look, it is one of the things I do miss. I, I don't know if you're the same. I, I do miss that kind of keyhole, that access to Europe. Probably took that for granted, you know, just jumping on a jumping on a train. You're in France within an hour. I reckon anyone you know. that moves to Australia realises that they massively regret yeah. not smashing Europe before yeah. they got here. Yeah. And it's kind of ironic <laughs> now that I, I actually pine to go back to Italy and go back to France yeah. being over here. Um, but then Australia's got so many cool places. Like there's so many things to, to touch here. Amazing wineries, food, culture, different kind of scenery as well. So yeah, we're, and we're different. Lucky. Like you know, like everyone goes to Bali over here, or they go to the Philippines or yeah. Japan or yeah, New Zealand. New Zealand. Yeah. It's a different type of big time. Yeah, big time. What you're yeah. seeing is different. Yeah. Have you so moving moving on from that? I I see you as a a network. Can I call it that? A networking mogul. Can I say that? You can call it whatever you want. <laughs> have, have you always been? Have you always been the guy that connects the dots and uh, the guy that wants to organise the event and get people together? And you're very good at pinpointing this individual to this individual. I think you guys would work well together. But I think it, it's not something that you, you just do it naturally. Yeah, thank you. Um, I've, I've not always done it. I think I've done it more since being here, again, starting again uh, with my network. I guess where it probably comes back to the, the, the genesis of it. So my dad uh, has his own business. He's run his own business for over 30 years doing commercial vehicle spares. Okay. So he's, um, you know, he's been in that sales role, that kind of relationship, that partnership role. And I guess I've learned a lot from that. And there's probably values that have been instilled in, in us that I've taken from that. And then my mum and dad would, would they, had a, they had a big community of friends, but they'd always host dinner parties and they'd always be going to events. So there's probably no accident that I'm in sales, partnerships, like helping people, but like running events as well. Yeah. Um, and I think for me, 
I get a lot of fulfillment through bringing those right people together. And so, again, it kind of goes back to when you start your network again, if you can put people together that you just know that are going to be a good fit, you know, um, they're going to get along socially, they're going to get along well because they like whiskey or watches or music or cars or something. That's that's that normal, that common ground, that anchor of a, of a conversation or of a relationship or something that then flourishes. And I guess that was really how, so I run a, a networking business called Bio. And, yep. and so that's, that's how that started was working in referral partnerships. You know, I was, I was the problem solver for such a small thing, be it, you know, finding a property for a client or sending money overseas to pay for a property or pay for a watch or to book a holiday. And so very quickly I went, well, if I'm doing that one thing, you guys need to be talking to each other to kind of net off the business, if you'd like, to make sure that the client was in that really nice ecosystem of good people where they're going to get a good experience, but also that we're all going to help each other's business grow because that's where it's fun. Like no one is successful on their own. And no one work, wants to work with people that they don't necessarily like. Exactly. Like we all come to work yeah, to earn money and all that kind of stuff, but we all want to have a bit of fun. And it's where you spend most of your time, isn't it? Exactly. So if you can hang out with the people that you want to hang out with, if you can do work with the people you want to do work with, attract those clients that value you and they trust you and you want to help them, you can't not, not have a good time. It's one thing that I've always known is that I, I've been... I left the Marines when I was 23 and spent the rest of my life self-employed. Yeah. Um, and the one thing that I've learned out of it is if a deal's too good to be true or there's someone that's maybe giving you a bit of an itchy feel, yeah. maybe you should, shouldn't bother. Yeah. Um, you've got to enjoy who you work with. I always think you've got to, you've got to work with the type of people that you'd love to go and have a beer with. Yeah. Yeah. They're the best people to work with. So how did you go from going from the Marines, which is like super regimented, like I can imagine ninety nine point nine percent of your day is planned and structured, to then being self employed where nothing is structured and it's super like you're on your own. So you've gone from this pack mentality, this brothers in arms mentality to right, it's just me, myself and I. I've always had a very independent entrepreneurial brain. Mm. So I'm an only child. Mm. It was just me and my mum growing up. Mm. My mum didn't have a lot of money, so it always meant that I wanted to go and do a deal. Mm. So whether it was buying my mate's car, cleaning it and flipping it on piston heads or auto trader, or whether it was... Listing it in max power or fast Listing it magazine. anywhere to get any money <laughs> to do anything. Like I would literally... I remember wheeling my mate's car down the road, had no brakes, nothing. Yeah. I bought it for 150 quid, cleaned it, I think there was a bottle of whiskey in the back worth about £100. Yeah. Um, sold it to a guy in London who basically pulled it apart for spares and repairs a week later. Yeah. And I was 17. It's yeah. so like I, you know, I was just a young lad that wanted to flip and make yeah. a bit of money. Um, but also equally, like I didn't have, I didn't have a dad like yours that yeah. had a business that yeah. could teach me about all of these things that you can do in, I just thought you had to get a job, yeah. right? Yeah. So I thought, okay, well, I'm a hard worker. I'm going to join the military. I'm going to join... Yeah. Um, a government sector, fire service, anything like that. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, I was always, I've, I've always been comfortable on my own because I was on my own a lot growing up, I think. Mm, mm. Um, so it doesn't bother me to see the bigger picture and go through a bit of suffering. Mm. So when I moved, I literally got a one way ticket when I left the Marines, moved to Dubai. I think within about three or four months, I just knew that if I didn't, if I didn't get any clients, I wasn't going to make any money. Yeah. So I need to do whatever. Got it is that I need to do. Yeah. I think I printed a letter that yeah. I wrote on an A4 piece of paper because I couldn't afford leaflets. Yeah, yeah. And I printed like 3,000 pages yeah, at yeah. my stepdad's office. Yeah. Um, and I went to every house around the area where the pilot's compound was near where we lived. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I just put it through the door on everything. Yeah. And I think only one bloke called me. Yeah. But he called me. I worked with him. He Start referred somewhere. me to someone else, you know, and that, that's how it, that's how it built up. So just want to interrupt you quickly. Obviously we're going through a bit of a turbulent time at the moment. Interest rates are going absolutely through the roof. Um, anyone that's coming off a fixed rate, anyone that's looking to buy a property at the moment that might be struggling, that might think actually I might need John's services, um, as a buyer's agent, or I might need to talk to Ross, 
about the fact that my fixed rate is ending or I'm drowning at the moment in payments or I'm really struggling to navigate property at the moment, um, just please reach out. All of our details will be in the description below. And a massive shout out to Oscar Hunt for hosting us here today. Some amazing suits, some tailored suits here. Um, they're actually beginning a women's line very shortly. Back to the podcast. You obviously went through the university route and then your mate introduced you to the uh, foreign exchange business yeah. and you naturally sort of start going through that sales process and all the rest of it. Yeah. I kind of went down the other end and I was like, oh God, if I don't make a sale, I'm literally gonna yeah. like have no money to go out and yeah. socialize or do anything. It was interesting because <clears throat> I guess for me, in the early stages of the career, it was a lot of the flow was incoming mm. because again, it was just the timing of life where that, that buying a property overseas, that aspirational, the, the migrating to Australia, you know, a lot of that was, was <coughs> um, people wanting to do it themselves. So there wasn't a lot of that cold calling, but what it enabled you to do was, because you, you, when you do a cold call and structure a cold call or when you structure an incoming sales call, you structure them very differently. Yeah. Um, and so it enabled, it enabled you to, to, I guess, take the, the nuance out of the incoming calls and then almost throw that into the cold call because you were solving the problems, you knew the problems that you were solving already. You weren't just smiling and dialing for the sake of it. Yeah. So I kind of liked the way that I learned that bit. And then you got a bit of the seasoning from the old man and a bit of the bit of the sass from mum with the dinner parties, all that kind of stuff. So. I found that um, I remember being in Dubai and just thinking, if I can get the wealthiest echelon of clients, so I can get paid the most money per hour. So yeah. who? So, but what do they want? Yeah. They want convenience, yeah. and everyone in the UAE wants convenience. Yeah. So I remember sitting there and thinking, well, where all the wealthy people work? They work in the Dubai International Financial Center. Yeah. And what do they do on their lunch breaks? They do what I do now. Now I'm a mortgage broker. Yeah. And I go and meet people like yourself and other people and they go for lunch. Yeah. So if I can go to them and buy them a coffee and buy them lunch yeah. during a consultation, I think it was something like a 95% conversion rate yeah. on my consultation. So I was like, well, if someone's called me and I said, you know what, I'll come to you yeah. and I'll buy you lunch, how about that? And they but go, well, yeah, it's a no brainer. But the way that you're looking at it, so you're looking at it very similar to I do, where there's opportunity everywhere. So you, mm. you come from a sense of abundance, right? Yeah. To be like, I used to go on the train to London um, and I used to look around and go, everyone was on the, reading the Metro or on their phones and I'd be like, there's so much missed opportunity here where you could just literally look at the lady or the Talk man next to you and go, <laughs> yeah. so what is it you do? Yeah. Um, and especially here in Australia where property is like a sport over here, you know? It is. It's, it's like getting a tax refund and buying a home is like a sport. So yeah. As a broker or a buyer's agent, we can walk anywhere and you're going to be able to talk to anyone and you're going to be able to help someone. Really. Yeah, they, help might not them, like, yeah. they might not want to take it, but at least you can go, well, hey, this is what we do. And, I'm you know, about if you need we're, me. We're, I'm, I'm, I'm here if you want. Yeah. Um, and, you know, so I think that's just that mindset where you come from and I come from is just that because we want to help, we don't want to sell because we're happy to have a conversation and we're not screaming at someone to just pitch them all the time. It's more of a consultative approach and an experience for the client or whoever we talk to rather than hammering them on the phone. Like we've all, like no one likes to be sold to, right? I'm, I'm in sales. I'm it's like easy, going to a car sales I'm the easiest place, person to sell you know? to. Yeah. I'm wearing a pink blazer, do you know what I mean? <laughs> I'm the easiest person, I bought this on my own. Um, I'm the easiest person to sell to, but I hate being sold to. Yeah, I hate, I hate it. You know, if and, I realise someone, it you can smell it. <laughs> you yeah. can smell it. Especially Rental agents are the worst for it, I think. Or, or, the, or the wine guys. As the well. wine like, guys, you know, yeah. Oh, are you still drinking Chardonnay, Mr. Sermon? You know, yeah. you've not spoken to me to, for, for four years. Yeah. No, I am, but not that. Yeah. My taste buds have evolved. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll put that yeah. in the ragu. No, I don't. Um, but that's the thing is if you can learn the, 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 if you love it, and this is what I learned when you are in sales. Um, can I swear on this? You can do what the fuck you want, mate. So you've got to, well, one thing I've learned, and, and I will take for this what you want, is you've got to have a give a fuck factor. So what you are selling and what you're talking about every day and who you're working with, you, it's got to land and resonate with you because that's the passion that's going to go flow through when mm. you're speaking to someone. Yeah. So I can't be as passionate about helping someone buy property in Sydney as I could do about selling double glazed windows yeah. or, or air conditioning units. Not that there's anything wrong with that. That's just not my vibe. You know, I loved working in the foreign exchange space because I saw the value of saving someone 10 grand when they transferred money home or they brought money into the country. 
I've seen the value of saving someone $60,000 on buying a property in Sydney. And people go, how did you do that? Cool, happy to tell you how I do that. So that's my one learning in all these years is you've got to care about what you're, what you're talking about every day. So I call it the, the give a fuck factor. I think that was the same for me. Like any job that I've ever done or any role that I've ever had has always been really, the core of it has been about how can I help someone? Yeah. You know, like I joined the military because I wanted to f feel like I was doing some good in the world. Mm. I became a personal trainer after that because I thought, well, you don't really learn much in the military in the way of, you know, job prospects and stuff like that. But you can go down the fitness route or you can go down the security route. But security, yeah. am I really helping anyone? Yeah. Okay, some wealthy guys getting protected. Who yeah. really cares? Um, the personal training route was like, you know, this is amazing. Like I'm helping these people transform their lives and I'll ma manage to eventually get into obesity and diabetes specialist and... Um, psychology and dealing with all these clients that have got you know drug problems and mm. they've just got divorced and they're depressed and they're on pills and mm. you know you sort of work through that and then I remember coming over to Australia and thinking you know I, I want a Monday to Friday lifestyle that I can um, take my kids to school and pick them up and have my weekends and mm. I thought wow I love property I think everyone should invest in property mm. um, if I can help people save money on their mortgage if I can, you know, when interest rates are high, if I can switch them to another lender or push them to a different structure, like an interest only investment property structure to save them their house, yeah. then fantastic, yeah. well, well, brilliant. You? you do it because you care about it. Yeah. Um, and it doesn't have to come across as salesy then because really you're just like, what is your, like I'm trying to figure out what it is in your yeah. best interest. Yeah. Um, you know what you know i want to i want to know how the kids are and i want to know yeah. you know how work is and did you get a promotion recently and yeah you know um did, that, did, did how did the interview go at the new job you know i'm i'm interested in their personal lives just as much as i am about you know trying to structure something within the service that i offer yeah to to but that that's person where you've got you've got a bit more <coughs> tenure though right so when you look at and this is why uh, i i try and say to younger people that are in the sales game as well is that you know especially now with with LinkedIn and everybody's on social media everyone's on TikTok and all that so your your personal brand is 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 bigger than ever before and people especially i guess in in Australia because we've got a smaller population and then you you nuance down to smaller communities like the property industry or the finance industry or the PT industry or the marine industry you know your 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 name carries a lot more weight than it used to you can't hide a lot of places anymore yeah so it's that kind of thing of make sure your values are in check and in line because if you're selling someone something dodgy you can be found pretty quickly um and you know we are a review culture we are that five star google review uber yeah you know, all of that so it's like you're only as good as your last you, meal right? you've got to be in check and that's where again going back to if you don't love it don't do it like yeah. find something you love because if you are going to talk about it and and again if you're not liking it and you're stressed with kpis all that kind of stuff so we don't have kpis where we work no, neither so do it's we. very much around. If you want to do it, do it. Like you can you earn, can as, earn much as much as you want, or as little or as, as you li like. As yeah. little as you like. But yeah. Sydney's not a cheap place to to live yeah. if you're not earning anything. Yeah. So, but there's a bit around that to go. Well, again, if you do nothing, nothing happens. But because you have that factor, because you're surrounded by good people, because you're enjoying it, you want to do well. You want to do well for your team. You want to do well for your clients. You want to do well for your peers. You want to do well for you. Um, so there's a lot of power in that, but if if you didn't like it, you wouldn't you wouldn't care. Tell me about moving from FX to property, like your journey. Yeah. yeah so I um look, I was so I did 18 years in money transfers in FX over two companies, and I guess for me, um, it, it exposed me to so many different industries. But the 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 problem I was solving was the same. It was transferring money. So I, I built this phenomenal network, and again, I was I was almost like the FX guy, you know, um, which was great. Um, you know, kind of proud that I, I put that together. Um, I then decided to have a bit of a change of change of pace. Um, just I, I wanted to have a different conversation, and so I did a bit of time in this payment gateway company. It wasn't wasn't my cup of tea. Very very grateful for the period of, of that time. I, I was only there five and a half months. I. I Called it a day before my, my six month probation because I just knew it wasn't for me. By day three, I knew it wasn't for me. But I was unsure whether it was a, my gut 
or whether it was kind of new job, new new industry jitters, because yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd done the same thing forever. Yeah. But in my heart, I knew it wasn't for me. And so what what the good that came out of that was, was one, I was unable to go, I don't want to work in this industry. I don't, I don't, this doesn't light my fire up. This doesn't light me up to talk about it every day. And then the other piece was actually a lot of my referral partners that had worked with and I'd looked after their clients came out and said, hey, let's have a chat. So I had this kind of all the way from your big four accounting firms to banks to startups to all these other businesses saying, can we have a chat? And then um, uh, Chris Gray from Your Empire reached out and I'd known Chris for 10 years. He'd actually helped me get on the ladder myself and, and bought my property. So I was very aware of the business. He's a good mate. I liked his values, I liked the way he did things, I liked my experience, and, and he literally just said, let's go for a beer, so very Aussie, ironic, considering we're both poms, um, and he said, mate, I'd, I'd like you to, to be part of the business, and I've spoken to the team, and the whole team around the table, and he's like, I'd like you to be part of the business, and we want you to, to build out the, the partnership channel, so exactly what you did in your previous role, but, but do it with us. Um, Again, it was that kind of cultural fit, the values piece, the integrity, the I'm going to care about what I do. And so I guess to the untrained eye, it was a bit like, oh, John's going through maybe a midlife crisis because he's gone FX to FinTech to property. <laughs> but actually, in my mind, it was just switching the conversation around how do I help you with your money transfer? Because I'd done it myself. Yeah. And I know how it works. And I know how we can save you money. So then how do we help you secure a property in Sydney or Brisbane or Melbourne? And I can tell you because I've done it myself. Yeah. And so it had that factor that, that for me resonated. And I guess my experience was one of integrity where you know the team actually walked away from a deal because it was overpriced. So we have this thing where none of our clients overpay on property in Sydney, yeah. which is probably a rare thing to say. We, you know the prices of property in Sydney, but we yeah. just have our things that we put into place. And I guess the experience and the relationships where that comes in. So that was that that transition but I guess my first day at your empire I mean I bought my first property with them or they bought my first property in 2015 so I knew the team you know so I felt like part of the furniture already yeah because they had also done such a good job of 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 keeping me engaged and updated on how my properties were doing and what's going on and you, you could know. see the value in yeah. the business yeah so I was a bit like well if I can add my skill set here mm. And, and I guess bring my network of people that like doing business with John and, and like the way I operate and how I how I sell, you know, how I communicate, then hopefully that's a really good story. And, and it's funny it because um, the way that I fell into jobs is a very similar approach to how you have. Mm. I don't think I've ever had a proper interview, really. No. More like a chat and a beer yeah. and a catch-up. I mean, like... I'm with Strategic Brokers now, and me and Hong met at a party the year before. Yeah. Um, I was with a different brokerage at the time, and then we kind of met up later and was was talking in the new year, and he was like, oh, let's have a conversation. Maybe we should, uh, you know, maybe we should come over to the team and stuff, and, and, and that was it. But it's more about, like, you know, when you meet these people, you know, what, what strings can we add value to each other? Exactly. Um, on where where can we where can we develop this relationship? How do we bring out the best in each other? How do we network together and make sure that we can you know improve each other's success levels? Yeah, and all the rest of it. Um, one little tangent that I do want to go on. Oh, stand by. Yeah, is um, <laughs> there's another side to Big J. <laughs> there is, D yeah. DJ Big J. <laughs> oh, I never put um, the DJ in front of it. Okay, it was just, okay, just Big J. It was J. just Big J. Yeah. yeah, or it is just Big J. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I alluded to the fact I'm not I'm not the athlete that I once was. <laughs> um, <laughs> I, I outsource a lot. I probably outsource my sports skills, uh, but I do love my music and and I love I love my trance, my drum and bass, my kind of house music. So I think kind of you know defected in the house, head candy before it got bought. Um, you know, state of trance above and beyond and Juna Deep. I love all that stuff. Um, and so I DJed in Windsor um, in a place called Bar B for years, Friday and Saturday nights. And then for me, when I moved here, it was another way of, of building a network, building a community outside of my work. So I started off a night with a couple of guys, uh, Jeremy and Adam, called Digital Therapy. So we ran that for six years. We played at the Civic Underground. We played at Home Nightclub. We hosted a few stages at Electronic Gardens. So we had like Hernan Catania on our stage, Jeremy oh, Alanda, damn. Nick Warren. Um, we had guys like Factor B, Matt Bowditch, um, 
flew them over from the UK. So that for me was building a network outside of my corporate life. But it was just the, the two naturally intertwined because, and again, it comes back to being the host, right? So with bio, I'm the host. You know, when I'm talking to clients at your empire, I'm, I'm the host. So with digital therapy, I was the host of this night. So although we only had 300 people in the room, I'd make sure everybody was okay. I'd make sure I knew who was in the room. How did you hear of us? You know, the old marketing days, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you hear of us? Because we weren't big on the advertising. You know, we didn't do the printed flyers. It was all word of mouth. And so we did that for six years and had some amazing times. You know, met my heroes like Ferry Corsten. Yeah. I remember getting massive stage fright because he had the same watch on as me. And I was just, my bottom lip just started to go. I was like, keep it cool, John, keep it cool, keep it cool. And I, just, and I just didn't, I just didn't. But yeah, so I do that and I, I still love doing that. And I find it, I mean, COVID for me, it was super cathartic um, because on a Friday, because we couldn't do anything, I'd finish up and it was when we were kind of back to back on Zoom calls. And I just have a mix. I just crack a bottle of wine and just mix for three or four hours. And it just takes you back to, you know, like you know, when I DJed in Ibiza or when I DJed at Ministry of Sound, you, know, you play this tune and you go, oh, I remember when I first met that person there. Did and you do a season? How, how long did you do an Ibiza? Oh, I didn't do a season. I just did it a couple did, of nights. Did a few nights. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So it, was, it was a bar called The Orange Corner. Um, and the night before um, I actually got married, I played at Turnmills in London, which Turnmills no longer exists. Yeah. Um, which was cool. So there was just, it was another little thing where, I mean, look, people buy, I think Seth Godin says, you know, people buy relationships and stories. We're all human, right? So it's like, why not tell people that you, you know, you box or you love to dance or you, you DJ or you like your golf or your cars? Like, again, it comes back to that that anchor focus of a conversation. Yeah. Because no one likes doing business with robots, right? This is why, no. this is why AI is interesting. But that's a very different podcast. But people want to do business with humans. And I remember seeing people. I remember seeing clients when I was DJing at like Metro, and you'd look down kind of front and center, and and you'd see someone looking at you going. Is I recognise you. Is that, is that, is that the FX guy? Is that yeah. the property guy? Yeah. And he's like, yeah. Hello, mate. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you get the call on Monday morning. Did I see you? Brilliant set, by the way. Can I buy <laughs> yeah. another house? <laughs> so, um, so, yeah, no, I, I, I love it. And again, it just enabled me to, to build another networking community and a great right. circle of friends because you're just sharing stuff. You're having a good time. You know, that, that's what it's about. That's why we moved here. Mate, brilliant. So, I think we're going to close up here mm. one last thing that i do want to ask you the one thing that you miss about the uk and the one thing that you love about australia or oh, the one thing i miss about the uk friends and family friends and family that's pretty much it the one thing i love about here um is just the attitude to life you know, it's it's here for the taking and everybody... It's ironic because Auss Aussies have this kind of tall poppy syndrome, but everybody loves to give it a go and give it a nudge and try. Mm. Um, they're real entrepreneurs. They, they want to grab life with both hands and whether it's the fitness side, whether it's the entrepreneurial side, whether it's getting up and going, watching the sunrise, like there's a real passion and a zest for life. Going for a dip in the morning at the going beach or whatever morning. it is. And, and I, I love that. And that for me is infectious. Um, I mean, it might just be because you live in the city here and you've got all this on your doorstep. And I didn't in the UK, but or it could be stage of life, like I don't know. But they'd be the they'd be the differences. John, absolute pleasure. Very welcome. Thank you very much. Like and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>